Welcome to the Renaissance and welcome to this edition of The Army as a Shame to Africa, Part 1. Here is an important notice. This video is research based. The goal is for you to go and read the reference materials yourself. Remember, the truth may be bitter, but like a bitter drug, the patient still needs it. Recall that we told you that the slave trade is still going on but subliminally till today, and that the national armies in countries that fall within what was Negro land were the slave raiding armies, renamed, rebranded, and given uniforms and weapons to continue whatever they were doing till today. So before we proceed, let us quickly show you that the slave trade did not cover the entire Africa but only covered a tiny portion where the Negroes lived at that time. So if we reference a book called A History of the Colonization of Africa by Alien Races, written by Harry H. Johnston and published in 1899, we see a map. This map has some shaded portions. The shaded portions are the areas from where the slaves were taken. So if you see somebody from South Africa or Zimbabwe or Somalia or those other places, they were not slaves at any point. The slaves were never captured from there. The concept and idea of calling them African Americans and all those were for the slave masters to masquerade and cover their tracks. So now that we understand the areas where the slaves were taken from and that it had nothing to do with those that lived near the water or those that lived closer to particular areas, let us now proceed to show you that the national armies you should see today were the slave raiding armies. Have you ever heard African kings made wars to catch slaves? and that Africans sold other Africans, and that Negroes were barbaric, or that the army is for defense, and that the army defends the territorial integrity of your country. And then you wonder if these African kings do not have names, and how could a king capture 1,000 people and they just follow him as if they are cattle, or why there are no old people in slave caravans, or why the firearms maker or the bomb maker is considered a hero, why the victims of the bomb or the firearms are considered barbaric vis-a-vis -vis the slave trade. And then you still wonder how could a king capture and sell millions? What happened to the army he used? And what is the origin of the armies we have today? How did Negroes, naked and living on trees, come out to form an army? Well, be it known to you today that the national armies you see in Africa today came from the slave raiding armies. The armies you see today were the same armies that captured and sold the Negroes as slaves. So if the chiefs made wars, it's certain they must have armies. So if we look at a slave caravan like the one on your screen, we see that there are some people with guns. Those are the same national armies you see today. The only difference is that they have been given uniforms and they continue to do exactly what they were created to do. But subliminally, they are still being trained and equipped by the slave masters. The same goal, the same principles, the same techniques, only that the Negroes are blind to it. So if we look at the image, we see when they get trained. They are trained by the same people. They are trained and given the same ideas just as you go to church from childhood and you are shown how to um, believe in God or believe in any religion you are brought up to believe. That's how the armies are trained too in Africa. The biggest budgets in Africa are the armies. They are still doing exactly the same thing they were doing then. The only difference is that they now wear uniforms and carry guns and are seen as doing the right thing. Whereas if you looked at the images, you see the same way they captured the slaves were the same way they behave today. The only difference is that they wear uniforms today. So let us quickly look at some of the troops or what they were like prior to the end of the slave trade, if it actually ended anyway. So if we reference a book called Modern Geography, Volume 2, written by Pinkerton John and published in 1802, it shows us that these fullers, it is said, can bring into the field not less than 16,000 cavalry and being surrounded by 24 pagan nations or tribes, these Mohammedans never hesitate 
to make war for the sake of procuring slaves. So if they are making wars, it is certain that it is one-sided. If it was war between the same people, that would have been a different story. Again, you have to ask yourself, if the Negroes were not like cattle, how could 1,000 people, 2,000 people or 3,000 people agree to follow the chief, get loaded into ships and brought to the plantations? If you believe the narrative that it was African chiefs, it is impossible because they were supposedly having only bows and arrows, which is impossible. But let us move forward by looking at other accounts of the slave raids. So, if we reference a book called A Tropical Dependency, an outline of the ancient history of the Western Sudan with an account of the modern settlement of northern Nigeria, written by Flora Elshaw, Lady Lugard, and published in 1905, we see the following account. It tells us that throughout this district, the army marched, murdering, burning, destroying as they went. The inhabitants, knowing the object of their march, usually fled before them to the forest, abandoning their property that they might save their persons. This maneuver was frequently successful and slaves were not always obtained. The villagers were nonetheless burnt and the surrounding crops destroyed. When prisoners were captured, only women and the young were kept. Full-grown men were massacred. On one day, Dr. Bath reports, a large number of slaves had been caught this day. Altogether, they were said to have taken a thousand, and there were certainly not less than 500. To our utmost horror, not less than 170 full-grown men were mercilessly slaughtered in cold blood, the greater part of them being allowed to bleed to death, a leg having been severed from the body. So we see how brutal the army was. So when you are being told, whether it is in Harvard or Oxford, that Africans sold other Africans or African chiefs did it, you should begin to ask yourself, especially if you're a Negro or a black person today, if someone came to take you, how you would just follow willingly your wife, your children, your parents, everyone, uncles, everyone gather and follow them, even if they had some form of remote control. That's the question you have to begin to ask yourself. If your professor, be it at Harvard or Oxford, tells you that Africans sold other Africans, one very simple way to expose their treachery is to ask him to give you some references and citations. Remember, he wasn't there. You were not there. So whatever he's teaching you is what he read from the accounts of those who were there. And the only way to show him that he is lying is to ask him for his references. That way, you will see that he won't be able to provide you with anything meaningful other than a narrative or some recent work done by some hungry author paid by the slave masters themselves. So let us move forward to see other narratives and accounts as well. We see again from the same book from by Flora Shaw and she tells us that the expedition returned on this occasion after two months to Bornu and when the total gains were reckoned up, they were found to amount to something over 3,000 slaves and 10,000 head of cattle. The slaves consisted almost entirely of women and young persons, mostly children, and the slaughter of full-grown males was said to have amounted to no more than 300, on 1 in 10. The great majority of full-grown males had therefore escaped, as had the more active of the full-grown young women. Of the 3,000 taken, the commander-in-chief claimed one-third. There remained 2,000 slaves and about 7,000 head of cattle to divide between the 20,000 persons who had composed the expedition. This is to say that if the spoil was evenly divided, each man would receive the tenth path of a slave and the third path of a bullock as his individual share. That such waste of life, destruction of property and loss of time could be considered, even from the purely practical point of view, to be compensated by such poor results is indication enough of how little all these things are valued among races where practices of this kind are countenanced. So now this is a British woman writing. She is writing as if she is not in support. Again, remember they tell us that the British or Great Britain stopped the slave trade, but they refused to tell us how they aided the slave trade. 
They refused to tell us about the slave ship called Jesus. They refused to tell us why Abraham Lincoln was killed barely two years after he freed the slaves. So now let us look at these accounts and we'll see that 20,000 people went for the slave raid and they have a sharing formula. That means they knew what they were doing. They knew the, the business they were into. There is nothing like coming today to tell you how the Negroes were barbaric while the Christians and Muslims who raided and captured the Negroes are now saints. So let us also move forward to see exactly what um, happened then. Here we see the Emir of Yola, a well-educated Fulani and religious fanatic, ordered the representatives of the Niger Company, notwithstanding treaty rights, to the contrary, to haul down their flag and close their trading station on the river. In Bauchi, the important town of Guram was destroyed and the population carried into slavery. Let us also see how the Europeans, the British, were part of the slave raiding so that you understand that it is hypocritical when they say they stopped the slave trade. So if we look at the same book by a British woman called Flora Shaw, it tells us that Another famous English sailor, Drake, who as a young man accompanied Hawkins on one of his earlier expeditions to the coast, was more humane or more fastidious in his tastes than his great leader, for after one experience, he never again went slave raiding. This is an European boy who probably went with Hawkins. If you remember, Hawkins was the captain of the slave ship called Jesus. So after that, the guy didn't go again because he saw that this was a brutal terror. So now you see, except for a patent granted in 1588 to Exeter merchants, the English trade was left during the reign of Queen Elizabeth in the hands of individuals. The first charter of an English company for the purpose of trading to the coast was granted by King James in 1619. So we see that the King James, you talk about King James Bible today, was a brutal slave raider. He aided and abetted the slave trade. So when they tell you the British stopped the slave trade, again, you need to ask basic questions. They are still the same ones financing and sponsoring the armies in Africa today. Remember, no one has told us exactly why Lincoln was assassinated barely two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Obviously, the British did not stop the slave trade because they were tired of it. They stopped it because the number of Negroes were becoming too many in their shores that they were scared of the number getting too strong to fight them one day. Let us move forward. It may interest you to note that both the Muslims and Christians, that's the Europeans and Arabs, saw the slave trade as a religious duty. They were doing it together. They saw the Negroes as pagans at that time. So you see where uh, King James or the um, Hawkins who captained the slave ship Jesus in his letters was writing that, and we read verbatim, it is interesting to observe in Hawkins' letters describing these and other expeditions, the perfect reliance of the mariners upon the Almighty to be on their side and to bring them out of all their dangers with good store of Negroes for sale. On one occasion, they were become for 18 days and in great danger of death from starvation, having so great a company of Negroes on board. But Almighty God, who never suffered his elect to perish, sent, we, sent we are told, a special wind to carry the slave raiders safe to their destination. And when they reached it, they obtained license to sell their cargo on the ground that their vessel was a ship of the Queen Majesty of England and that the cargo whatever they are saying, you see that these slave raiders believed they were doing the work of their God, which we certainly know today is not the almighty God that created heaven and earth and created the Negroes as well. So when they tell you that, oh, the Negroes were barbaric, while they, they were the slave raiders, including the Muslims who raided the slave and captured the slaves for them, then you should know they are lying and no true religion can be based on a false premise and lies. Let us move forward. If we reference a book called The White Man in Nigeria by George Douglas Hazeldine and it published in 1904, we see the following account or narrative. This is to show you how proud they were with the slave trade at that time because it was a noble business for them. 
These are people who saw themselves as doing the work of their God. Whoever that God is, is something of a different uh, story entirely. But the important thing is to note that they felt they were doing their religious duty. So when they tell you today that Islam or Christianity does not support slave trade, they are lying and you can read it them for yourself. So let we see where it tells us that this was one of the Fulani rulers, a relative of the Sultan of Sokoto who had persisted in slave raiding and when the Sultan wrote him not to do so, sent back the answer, can a cat stop catching mice? When I die, it will be with a slave in my mouth. He had twice fought the Niger company and had twice been beaten. So you see that they were doing it with a lot of pride. The same thing they are doing today. So remember, the whole topic about this video is the army. The reason we are showing you all these other ones is for you to see why you don't hear the names of the slave raiding chiefs or whoever made the wars and sold the slaves. You can't tell us that 3 million, 50 million people could have been killed or sold and nobody knows the name. But 12 million, 11 million in an alleged holocaust. We know Hitler, we know Bin Laden for 2000, but we have no name whatsoever. All you will hear will be something like King of Dahomey, which doesn't make sense because they know what they are hiding and they are still working on it till tomorrow morning. So let us move forward. Again, we read from Flora Show the same account of the Emir who was saying that you can't stop a mouse from a cat from catching mice, where it says, This Emir at a later period was captured by the British and when remonstrated with the High Commissioner and urged to abjure slave raiding and to accept British protection, he replied with graphic force, Can you stop a cat from mousing? When I die, I shall be found with a slave in my mouth. This was something they were doing with all the passion and aggression you can imagine. The same way they do today. If you went to a place like Nigeria and told them to stop selling oil for colored paper, which we are sure you know dollars is colored paper, and they sell oil for it and they are ready to kill you. If you mentioned anything that threatens oil today, the Fulani are going to kill you. That's the truth about it. So, you see, how as they find oil business today, you see he's an oil mogul. That's how slave trade was. They made the slave trade a noble business. People were celebrated for being slave raiders. We can show you an example, but for the length of this video, let us just move forward. So now, if we look at what we call the Nigerian army today, to show you that it is the same army masquerading as protecting anyone, we we'll see that it tells us that the history of the Nigerian army dates to 1863 when Lieutenant Clover of Royal Navy selected 18 indiges from the northern part of the country and organized them into a local force known as the Glover Houses. The small force was used by Glover as governor of Lagos to mount punitive expedition in the Lagos hinterland and to protect British trade routes around Lagos. In 1865, the Glover Hausa became a regular force with the name Hausa Constabulary. This is a lie, and which you know, any system that is built on a foundation of lies will continue to lie. You need a thousand lies to cover um, one lie. So let us see how this lie unfolds in our very eyes. So let us quickly also look at the Ghanaian army because that will give us an idea of how the transitions were made because they couldn't have just woke up one morning and say we have 60,000 troops they should go home because the slave trade had ended because it wasn't even easy to stop the slave trade. You have seen from the Fulani Emir who told us that when he dies he would want to be seen with slaves in his mouth. So that should tell you what they are still doing today because this, the Fulani still see everyone as a slave, you can imagine how desperate the chief was that he made such a pronouncement that appeared in more than one book. So you see the Ghanaian army claims to have been founded in 1957. They have higher chances of saying the truth than Nigeria because Nigeria still has an unfinished business with the Bight of Biafra which was a major slave port that they are hiding and subliminally attempting to complete their slave raiding to that territory till tomorrow morning. So now the Ghanaian army tells us that they were founded in 1957 but that their history dates back to sometime in 18 something which we see in the next um, slide. 
So here we see the Ghana Regiment in 1879. So it was this same Ghana Regiment that eventually metamorphosed into the Ghanaian army you see today. So your question becomes, who formed this army and what was it being used for at that time? Remember, this is 1879. By 1863, they were still struggling to end the slave trade. So let us quickly look at um, an account from Florida Shaw about the slave trade and what needed to be done in an effort to end it, at least in terms of compensation to the Fulani chiefs who argued that their economy was based on the slave trade. So again, we see from Florida Shaw, that is Lady Lugard, that the position of the Fulani chiefs was, however, in the first instance, profoundly modified by a condition which was of the very essence of British administration. A large part of their revenue had consisted of tribute paid in slaves and in some cases of the tithes levied on the produce of slave raids which they conducted either in person or by the medium of the commander of their troops. But under British government, the slave raid and the slave trade were abolished and all dealing in slaves became illegal. So now you see what she's talking about, compensation. Further down, and it tells us that the fact has to be faced by the administrator in Mohammedan Africa that the abolition of slavery is not a straightforward task of beneficence. It goes further down in the green part to say, property in slaves, whatever may be thought of it, be the enlightened conscience of Europe, is as real to the Mohammedan as any other form of property. Slavery is an institution sanctioned by the law of Islam and to abolish it without compensation to the Mohammedan slave owners would be an act of injustice amounting to nothing less than wholesale confiscation. So you see that while you abuse it praising the British for stopping the slave trade, they abuse it telling you that the slave raiders should be compensated. We have seen that King James that translated the Bible approved the slave trade. We have seen that Flora Shaw, whose husband was part of the colonial uh, monsters in um, sub-Saharan Africa, is in support of paying them um, compensation because of um, stopping the slave trade. Whereas the people whose family houses, children, lives were destroyed, the Negroes were not even thought about in the first place uh, as worthy of compensation. So you see exactly how they work. So till today, that's what they are doing. The reason we brought you to this point is you remember the Ghanaian army of 1874. These things were happening before or after 1863, after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. First, what was the slave raiding army in Nigeria to be rebranded as Nigerian army? You saw where they said they started in 1863, which is not true. So let us see how these things or how the dots connect between these things. Remember when the Nigerian army claimed that the army was formed in 1863 when Glover took some 18 houses to Lagos to form whatever they said. Now let us look at the book called Life of Sir John Harley Glover written by Lady Glover and published in 1897 to see what he says. Again, you will need to see where why they are always lying because they have to lie in order to cover their tracks. There may be some innocent people in the army who may not know this ugly history, but the truth is they are still doing exactly what they were doing as slave raiding army till today. So let us see exactly where uh, their lies crumble. We see that in 1873, Sir George Barclay became governor of Lagos when Captain Glover's policy was resumed and consequently British trade revived. Lagos began to grow and flourish once more. Slavery was checked. The coast tribes were kept in their proper place. Communication with the tribes in the interior was resumed, but the process was slow and it was long before the country recovered the check it had received. While Captain Glover was still on leave in England, new complications arose in Africa which led to war with Ashanti and it will be seen in next chapter how he was sent by the war office to advise the authorities with regard to raising native troops and utilizing the rivers and roads into interior through which they must pass. Now remember, they told us that in 1863, the army had already been formed, but by 1873, they were still looking for how to form it. 
So now it goes further to say, there can be no question that the main exciting cause of the Ashanti War of 1872 to 1873 was the secession by the Dutch to the British Crown of Elmina and their other settlements on the Gold Coast in April 1872. So again, what we wanted to show you here was that the army was never formed in 1863. It was just renamed Nigerian Army. And we don't, we're not even sure if that rename was done then because the truth is, this is what was told later. It was the same way they concocted the alleged amalgamation. So if you doubt whatever we are saying, all you need to do, if you know any Nigerian that is a PhD holder, be it in um, um, African history or anything, just ask him. He's going to tell you that Lugard created uh, Nigeria in 1914. He's going to also tell you that Nigeria um, was amalgamated in 1914 because that's what we were taught. And because of cognitive dissonance, many people believed it. So they become PhD holders without going back to check what they were told and how true it could be. Now, we are not disputing the fact that there was an army formed by Glover, but it is not what you call Nigerian army today. They just concoct stories to hide the fact that they were a slave raiding army. Let us look at their insignia and you will see something very interesting. Here you see the insignia of what is called the Nigerian army today. No one knows when it was created or when it was formed. But the interesting thing to look at is the Arabic inscription there, which they tell us means victory belongs to Allah. Now remember, at that time, there were people, the Negroes hadn't accepted Islam or Christianity, except the few in the north, the black people mostly. And again, remember that the Negroes were not um, Muslims and Arabic was not their language. So why is it Arabic? At which one was it created? Because normally you would tell us or they claim that there was an amalgamation in 1914, which has been proven to be a lie. They also claimed that um, the army started in 1863 through Glover, which we also know is a lie. So the question becomes, at which point was this insignia created? Anyway, before we uh, end this um, uh, presentation, just bear in mind that the army you see in Africa today is the same slave raiding army and they are protecting the same concept of selling st slaves. Remember, they sold the slaves for rum and um, other garbage like toys and weapons. Today, they sell the resources for colored paper and they also prevent anyone from harnessing the human capital among Negroes. This is something that will be a subject of a different presentation at another time. Let us just quickly look at what Flora Shaw or, and Frederick Lugard had to say about Africa before we conclude. So if we reference the dual mandate in British Tropical Africa by Right Honorable Frederick D. Lugard and it was published in 1922, we see what he tells us about um, Africans being worshippers of force. So we see from the highlighted portion, it says, Islam as a militant creed, which teaches contempt for those who are not its votaries, panders to the weakness of the African character, self-conceit and vanity. Centuries of lawless strife have made the African a worshipper of force, and he has been quick to adapt the creed of the conqueror, chiefly for the prestige it brought. Its very essences, the capture of women as slaves and concubines, and the looting of villages, though hateful enough when he is himself the victim, form the band, the bill ideal of his desires, if he can be the aggressor. It is the law of might to which he is habituated. So we see that this is something known to the Europeans. And interestingly, both Lugard and his wife said the Fulani should rule. So when you see them working with Muslims against the Negroes in Africa using their army and everyone else, that is exactly what they are doing. This is a message for those descendants of former slaves in the US who are sent by their governments to come and help impart evil on other people and oppression in the name of things like, oh no, we are supporting the army because they want to sell their weapons. It is a message for you. You are part of the slave trade without knowing. That is where they think the Negroes do not have brains. 
This is why it is happening. Your question should be, if you are a descendant of former slaves from the US and you are sent to places like Nigeria to go and do some of the evil you know they are doing, your question should be, why are they not doing that in Europe and America? Why are they sending you? All the weapons being used in Africa are being uh, exported and done by between Europe and America. Yet, we say Africans are hungry, but you wouldn't give them food. You wouldn't give them better ideas and initiatives of how to do things better. You give them weapons. And the goal is keep them hungry, give them weapons so that they can be killing themselves. Remember Barack Obama. People will think, oh no, he was um, an African or something or whatever you might think. He was a lackey. All they did with him was to use him to sell their ideologies, which may not be good for the Africans. Whatever be the case, it was this same Obama that was used to impose the same Fulanese you see written everywhere by the slave masters as the lords on Nigeria today. And we have seen how many people that have been killed, innocent people, and no word from either the United States or the Europeans. And unfortunately, the descendants of former slaves are there, imagining who they think sold their forebears without asking themselves, what is the difference between the Negroes and Africans? And who and who are behind the weapons that are being sold to Africans? Why is it that they call for gun control in the United States, but you never hear them talk about gun control against the military, the army that was the slave raiding army that captured and sold their forebears as both Muslims and Christians in working as a joint venture? We hope we have been able to give you some thought-provoking things to research on. We hope we have also been able to enlighten you. We thank you very much for listening. And please remember to go and read the materials referenced here yourself. The challenge is not for you to listen to what we're saying. The challenge is for you to look at the books, read them yourselves. They say the best way to hide something from a black man is to write it down in a book. Do not allow that to be true in you. Thank you very much once again for listening. Shalom.